Welcome everybody to this week's episode of Ask an Astronomer. Uh, my name is Stefan. I'm here with Andrew from, um, from the Uni University of Cambridge on the Institute of Astronomy. We are um, PhD students um, and we're here to answer all your questions about, you know, science, the universe, everything. Um, so just um, come on, like join, send us a message in the chat on YouTube or just on the uh, Slido link that's in the description or here on the screen you see it. You go on sli.do um, and enter the code astronomy. You can send us questions there. Or if you're watching on Twitter, you can also send us questions via Periscope. And, and before we start, maybe let me uh, let, I'll let you introduce yourself and tell us a bit about what you're doing in your in your life and in your research. <laughs> Hi. Um, yeah. So I'm um, I work in galactic archaeology. So my my field very very different to Stefan's is much closer to home, I look at stars within our own galaxy and try to use those to work out how our galaxy formed, how it developed its mass, how it came to be, how it is today, um, how stars grew out of that and how also the, the galaxy worked as a sort of machine or mechanism. So as stars orbit round, um, there are all sorts of interesting characteristics they have and uh, orbital properties which give our galaxy its shape, provide uh, galactic bar, spiral arms, all the structures you may be familiar with if you've seen any uh, mock images of the galaxy. Um, and so how those form, how they're created, how we get structure falling into us, we get galaxies which fall in and merge with the Milky Way. Um, those are all the sorts of things I look at, which is, uh, yeah, exciting stuff to work on. And a, a different approach, to, I think, so to many others to finding out how, um, how galaxies form and evolve by just looking at the stars which are, are nearest to us. Yeah, that's, that's certainly a very, very cool field. Um, maybe <laughs> you just mentioned that my field, uh, indeed, that's, that's cosmology. So I study, well, you could say kind of archaeology of, of the whole universe. Basically, we try to find out how did the universe kind of start at the beginning, how did it expand, and how do kind of all the large structures today got created. Like a big field of study is the cosmic, cosmic microwave background. That's basically the echo of the Big Bang that we can still observe today with radio waves mostly. And um, yeah, so for the questions, we got a few questions from last week already that we couldn't answer. So let's just start with these ones. And meanwhile, uh, just go ahead and type your questions in the chat um, slash or on Slido, and we'll, we're happy to answer them. Um, so we got the question, how close are we to discovering intelligent life uh, in the universe, apart from Earth, of course? Do you want to say something about this? Yeah, sure. I thought this was quite a cool question to have recently, because um, uh, some people might be aware that there was a very exciting discovery um, within the last, what was it, two weeks ago now? Or maybe a little bit longer, I can't remember now. A bit longer, I think, yeah. But anyway, there's a, a chemical um, phosphine was uh, first confidently detected on Venus. And phosphine is a chemical which is very closely related to life. I think it's it's not that we create it, humans create it, it's certain um, different uh, life forms which have evolved on the Earth to create phosphine. And that's one of the only ways we know that phosphine can be created in large amounts. And that was found on Venus which is incredibly surprising. Um, so that was a really exciting discovery, which might mean that there could be life in other um, places closer than we thought, and there's been various theories about what that could be. Um, but more generally across the stars, I, I feel like, this, I don't know, this is, this is a tricky one because it depends how likely we think life is to exist, How odd, what are the odds of us or life forming on the Earth in the first place, which is really hard to calculate. If we could calculate that, it'd be much easier to work out how likely it is to form on another planet. Um, but since we've only got one sample, which is us, it's really difficult to know how likely we would have been to form in the first place. So in terms of surveys and observations, I feel like we're getting to the point where we have the capacities to see signatures of, of life on planets around other stars. Very simple chemical signatures similar to phosphine, um, which a lot of people are working on now, such so a really exciting field. But how long it would be, until we would find a detection of something which signifies life. I, I guess that just depends how, how likely it is for life to, to have evolved on any particular planet. Some people are still looking at um, Ganymede and, and Europa, trying to look for life there. It's another potential source. Um, so there's, there's a lot of options, but I, th I think constraining the odds of finding it and putting that into a time frame it is incredibly difficult. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think, I think that's a really hard question to answer. Um... Well, the next question we got is, okay, maybe I'll put the one follow-up question here uh, first. Uh, how, do, how do you decide if a species is intelligent? 
Um, I think that's a that's a really difficult, uh, like that's a definition question basically. Um, I, like probably in practice, it will probably be quite obvious if someone like a species is intelligent. Like they will be probably either either really really intelligent, like much more intelligent than us, or you know kind of some plants and chemicals. Like I would. I would be really surprised if we, if we would find something kind of borderline intelligent where you wouldn't be sure. Uh, like given with what we see on Earth, um, I wouldn't, I would be because I don't think that's a big, like I think when we find life, we'll probably be quite sure if it's intelligent or not. Um, yeah, it's that time argument, isn't it? That you, you've, you've got all of this time when the, the planet has evolved, which has happened over, over billions of years. And yeah, it's what sort of uh, four billion years old, something like that. Yeah. Um, and the, the actual time frame of that which has had any life has been small and the time frame of that has had intelligent life is a minuscule fraction which the odds of you looking at another planet just as it had the sparks of intelligent life which we're pretty much still in now yeah is is, is vanishingly small so i feel like if you're going to find life the odds that it was intelligent life has got to be tiny right well i mean either either that or it's like like has been intelligent for billions of years I mean, basically, like, let's say humans don't care about extinct in the near future and live for, let's say, another billion years. Then we have basically a billion years where life is really primitive on Earth and you have kind of like cells and stuff. And um, then you have a few hundred thousand years where humans are like kind of like now and, you know, maybe there are some animals and things. And then the next billion years, it will be blindingly obvious that this life is very intelligent. So I think the probability of just hitting this time in the between where you're not sure is probably quite low. But um, if, they're, if they're way ahead, do we find them or are they going to find us? Ah, <laughs> good question, yeah. Um, I, I feel like today might be a day where you talk about the Fermi paradox, but let's, say, let's see if someone asks about it. Um, <laughs> I think you've invited someone to ask about it. <laughs> um, for now, I got a cosmology question lined up for myself, I guess. Um, is the density of dark energy, the cosmological constant, increasing? Which is a really nice question because um, it kind of asks what is it, what is like what is the density actually, and um, so maybe let me explain this in a bit more detail for, for everybody who's not familiar with the topic. Um, so what we what we see in the universe is certain types of matter. So we see normal matter, you know, like like tables, um, Earth, planets, stars, gases, and that's what we call kind of yeah, well normal matter or baryonic matter. And we also know that there's some kind of dark matter which is basically the same just invisible. So it is there, it's just kind of, just like, you know, normal matter, but it doesn't, it goes through us, it doesn't collide with us, and it is invisible to all intents and purposes, as far as we know. Well, we were trying to find it, but we didn't find it yet, so for now, let's go with invisible. Um, and then there's about 70% of the current energy density of the universe is made up of what we call dark energy. And we have no idea what it is, like calling it energy is already kind of something we don't know what it is at all. Um, so I think colleague energy is already kind of a stretch. And basically the reason we think there is something is because we see that the universe is expanding and it's expanding faster and faster. And the expansion of the universe depends on how much energy or how much matter there is around. So when there would be just the matter that we see today, the universe would be expanding, but kind of slower and slower. The expansion would be slowing down. But what we see is that the expansion is speeding up and getting faster and faster. And this speed up, this acceleration, needs some kind of energy um, to, to fuel it, so to say. And this we just call dark energy. We just see, okay, there must be this percentage of dark energy because this is how fast expansion is kind of accelerating. Um, but we have, of course, no idea where it is, where it comes from. Um, we're trying to find out. And now the question is, what is the density of this? So because we observe this accelerated expansion, um, we think that it should be a constant density, so the amount of energy per, say, cubic meter is always the same, even though the universe is expanding and we would think the energy should dilute. So that's a special thing about dark energy. Basically, if you have a box full of dark energy and you pull it, like, expand it to two boxes, you have twice as much energy without, kind of, any work. Um, this, okay, don't take, like, don't quote me on this. This work, work question is very hard uh, to define and whether or not energy actually, kind of, breaks over the dynamics or not. Um, that's very difficult in an expanding universe. But that's the point. Like the energy density of dark energy is, is constant. Um, but the fraction of the density in our universe that is dark energy is uh, increasing. 
So currently I said 70% of the energy density is dark energy, but of course all the other densities are diluting and getting lower and lower, which means the fraction of dark energy will increase and go to 90, 80%, 90%, up to almost 100% when time goes on. Um, so yeah, really good question about that. I, I guess a, 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 a naive follow-up, so I, I, this is something which needs to me to explain this to me. If you were, in some insane theoretical context, able to harness dark energy, would that therefore be a perpetual energy source? Hmm. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure if you can harness dark energy. That's a problem. Um, yeah. <laughs> 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 so that was really mean. <laughs> uh, no, that's, a, that's a really nice question. Um, but I don't, I can't, I can't come up, like, at least with a sort of simple mechanism of kind of harnessing the, the expansion. I mean, you know, you could think about something like, oh, make a rope between two stars and then, you know, put a dynamo on that. But that doesn't work. Like, they don't, like, A, things that are close to each other don't really expand. Like, Andromeda and Milky Way are not expanding away from each other, but in fact, falling towards each other. And of course, stars in our galaxy also don't go away. It's just on really large scales. Um, but I'm not sure in theory what would happen, you know, if you put a rope from here to, I know, a galaxy far, far away. Um, would be an interesting thought experiment I need some paper and pen, I guess, for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very, very good question, uh, Andy, as well. Um, okay. Uh, we got one more question from, from Slido from a few, few uh, weeks ago. Um, which state-of-the-art software, tools, software libraries are you using for data analysis and universe model simulations? And so there were a few questions about MATLAB, Mathematica, and Python in particular. Um, Andy, do you want to start and say what kind of your daily daily tools that you're using? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, the vast majority of my work works with Python. Um, purely because it, it's, it's nice, easy to code in, really good for data analysis. So I do a lot of vectorized programming in Python. Um, and yeah, it, it tends to have the vast majority of things I need to use. Um, I have used MATLAB a, a little bit, and it, it, if I was doing um, more statistical optimization problems, MATLAB's often got some better libraries for doing that. It's it's slightly more designed for for certain optimization problems. It's quite nice. Um, Mathematica, I, I I use a little bit. It's just really just for 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 dealing with equations. So if I, if I need to like build some formula for um, for what I'm, I'm doing or need to work out what the uh, some really complex integral works out as to make my, my programming easier, um, then I'll resort to Mathematica. Or, or if I'm feeling lazy, just go on to Wolfram Alpha and, and do that way, which is which is most of the time. I exactly agree with you. That's the same way I do it. Uh, I mean, outside those, the, the, the only other thing I've, I've touched on is I've done a little bit of um, C++ programming. So, Anyone who, who's really desperate for for speeds up in their code, um, who you know, if you if you work with simulators or anything like that, they'll they will use some um, slightly different formatted programming language, which is a huge amount faster. So, I think currently that would be C or C plus plus. If if it's some heritage code, that would probably be Fortran. Um, if you're if you're unlucky, <laughs> but yeah. but yeah, I I haven't done too much of that. So so yeah. So but the vast majority of my day to day stuff is is all in Python. Yeah, it's actually pretty similar to me. Um, so basically, Python is kind of the most, a uh, very commonly used language, probably the most commonly used language in science, certainly. And all the kind of tools that I use, uh, like the libraries for everything we, I do, at least, um, in, in Python. And it's really useful to kind of just put everything together. Like you have a code from someone that does something and some other library that does something, and you can just glue everything together with a little bit of Python. Um, and otherwise, for kind of simulation codes, it's just whatever like the, the person who wrote the code is using, like there's like codes of tens of thousands of lines. And well, it's easier to learn a programming language than you know rewrite this. So basically I, I do use a bit of MATLAB when I use codes of people that use MATLAB, sometimes Fortran for, well, Fortran codes, a lot of C for um, simulations that are using C. Um, but the stuff I write is, is almost always Python or C if I want to write something fast <laughs> once in a while. Um, yeah, nice question. I've had, I've had a cheat recently for that, which is um, there's a there's a Python package called Number, and if you if you write some relatively um, I don't know e easy to interpret code with that um, thing, it, I think it effectively translates your code into a faster programming language, 
and then ports it from Python into that language where it actually um, works. So it, it compiles your function in C++ or whatever. I think I think number goes to C++, runs it with the speed up from that, and then brings the result back to Python. Okay. Um, okay. Which is a nice cheaty way of getting it, getting to use the uh, the speed up from the other language without actually having to learn to code in that language. <laughs> Maybe it's cheap. But I'm I'm all about the shortcuts. <laughs> I just simply got a question from YouTube. Um, I'm kind of curious about the recent developments in radio astronomy. Um, very nice question. Um, actually, there are some, some interesting developments um, in radio astronomy, uh, which are called fast radio bursts. So actually, a couple of years ago only, I think maybe five years or so. Oh, my sense of time is a bit off. But a, f a few years ago, um, people started noticing in their data that when they analyze it in a different way, they detected that they are very short um, bursts of radio energy coming from some points in the sky that they hadn't noticed before because they were so short and they're just called fast radio bursts or FRBs and um, they seem to be, we don't know where they're coming from or what is creating them, they seem to be really powerful so they usually come from out of our galaxy and are still easily detectable here and actually at the moment people are building new instruments to ex like just for searching these bursts because we can probably do a lot of like science with them um, so currently it's more like accidental detection, which is actually something that happens really often in, in, in science. And there are some observatories like uh, CHIME, I think it wasn't even purposely built for FRBs, but it just happened to be really, really good for measuring FRBs. So they're, they're doing a lot of um, detections there. And I think it's a really like very new and very exciting topic. And yeah, I think there was one fast radio burst, which we think, um, well, we, there was one event in our galaxy, which we think was a fast radio burst but it was kind of a weak one, so we're not sure, uh, which came from, uh, I think, a magnetar. So that's basically a pulsar. So uh, pulsars are neutron stars, right? Um, that's rotating very fast. And this, this fast rotation and the magnetic fields of it, um, well, we're not sure what exactly made it emit uh, the signal, actually. So, so this, this magnetar uh, did emit this, this burst of energy. And we think either magnetars are kind of one source of these FRBs, or maybe they're different types of objects producing these fast radio bursts. It could also be mergers of stars or um, binaries, so systems of two stars that um, circle around each other. So there are various ideas. There are lots of crazy, um, um, interesting ideas as well, like like exotic ideas, let's call them, um, about like new physics or I'm not sure if there's a dark matter. I'm sure there's a dark matter candidate that also can produce them. Um, no, any no. Anyway, um, basically, when you look at this fast radio burst and you kind of look at its shape, you can see how far it traveled through the universe. So basically, light of different frequencies, especially in the radio regime, goes different speeds. So if it would be optical, you could say red light is slower than, say, blue light. And then you look at your burst and see, oh, does the red light arrive before the blue light? Or how much delay is there between the two? And then you can tell how far this object is away, how long it traveled. Um, and if you can find out where it came from, so from what galaxy, you can also measure the redshift of the galaxy and get information about about the kind of expansion history of, history of the universe. So you can can use this as powerful probes. And since they're so bright, we can probably measure them far, far in the distant past, which sounds really exciting. Um, so that's something that's going to be very interesting in like the next ten or much more years. I don't know. Certainly for yeah, for a few more years. Yeah. There's also uh, it's, it's also interesting that there's so many different. They, they vary a lot in their type. I think it's one of the reasons why it's become such an interesting and confusing field in that, you know, they, they, if you look at a different FRB, they, they might have different characteristics just in their observed signal. For example, the obvious one being that some, some are periodic, or very few seem to have a periodic signal where they repeat at set intervals, but the vast majority don't. Yeah. And, and that's really bizarre. We, we expect things to either, either be periodic because it's due to some kind of rotational effect whether it's something spinning or something orbiting, that would explain a periodic signal. But then you don't expect things to either be periodic and going away and then being reperiodic, or, or just some being periodic and some not. That suggests that there's some something very different going on there. So that's, um, yeah, that's that's become quite one of the interesting facts about it, that clearly there's a uh, a nice diversity within even just the, the this simple signal that, um, that, that means there'll be interesting mechanisms to explore. Um, yeah, it's an exciting field. Yeah, that's a really interesting part about um, like this repeating argument. Like many people also thought, oh, maybe it's just, you know, maybe we haven't found out that the other ones to repeat yet. Maybe they repeat slower or we have missed them by observing. 
Um, but that's certainly like really interesting. Like some of them like definitely repeat. Like we can't predict it. We can say, oh, tomorrow there will be a burst, and we can find it. But for others, we have no idea. Like we haven't found them just once and never again. Um, yeah. yeah. There are also some other actually developments now that I think about it in radio astronomy, which of course is twenty-one centimeter uh, cosmology, <laughs> which is kind of the field I'm working in. So since like the last few years, our radio telescopes have well, have been gotten good enough, slash R being kind of becoming good enough, um, to detect the the snickle of what we call of the all the neutral hydrogen that's flowing around in the universe. So we were able to do this kind of for our galaxy since a long time, and it's kind of a common thing to do in radio astronomy to discover the so-called 21 centimeter line, um, which is well emitted by by neutral hydrogen. But um, since well, basically I'm not sure, like five years or so. Uh, we, we have a detection, or we, we think that we might have a detection, of this, this neutral hydrogen back like a few billion years after the Big Bang, so quite early in the universe. Um, and that's, that's a quite, quite new field, and I think in the next, well, also like, I don't know, 10 years maybe, um, this will be really exciting, and we'll be, lots of, be able to do lots of science, especially because this neutral hydrogen is just everywhere. You know, when you want to observe galaxies, you have to, you know, observe where there are galaxies. If you want to observe the hydrogen in the universe, it's well, almost everywhere, um, especially at early times. So that's a really, really exciting and promising field as well. So I guess here astronomy is, is quite a good, good thing to be in. You also had the um, the Event Horizon Telescope, so oh. exciting big field. That's that's. So I, I, I guess I pre briefly explain what. So the Event Horizon Telescope you may have seen in the news. Oh, do you have the image? I oh. do have the image. Um, M87. Here we go. There it is. Beautiful. So the, the Event Horizon Telescope is a set of actually different radio dishes um, dispersed across the planet's surface. I forget where all of them are. One of them is at the South Pole. I forget where all the rest of them are. I think one of them is actually the Merlin one is, is in the UK. Um, but they're, they're all across the Earth's surface. Um, and the idea is that if you can get signals, radio signals from each of these separate dishes and then bring them together, sync up the signals and combine them, then you effectively have a collecting dish which is the size of the Earth. Um, so about as large a collecting dish as under current circumstances we can physically get. Um, and the thing about ra radio signals, because of the long wavelength, you really need a large collecting area in order to resolve small variations on the sky. So they use this, this huge baseline of the, the, the size of the, the radius of the Earth to um, observe the central black hole of, our, um, of a nearby galaxy, one of the local group galaxies, M87. Um, and the observations um, have been used to pr prove or, co or confirm um, Einstein's theories of relativity. Well, an another conf confirmation of Einstein's general theories of relativity, I thought there's, there's been a few different methods of, of confirming this is a really exciting one. As the first time we've directly observed um, a supermassive black hole. So that's, um, that's pretty crazy exciting. I think that are they currently working on doing it for, for Sagittarius A star, which is the Milky Ways, um, so our own galaxy's central black hole, um, is is the next target for the the event horizon. They, they're probably actually already observing that. They, this, I think, I mean, so we only got the results for that about eight months after the observations had finished being taken, because it took a long time to get the data from the South Pole to the actual um, to the, the the place the the setup where they were combining it. Because yeah. they had to, had to fly out after the winter or something, they literally had to fly the discs. Oh. They couldn't they couldn't trans do it wirelessly. It was too much data. Um, oh, so that's, that's were, interesting. Uh, yeah, so I think the, the the sheer volume of data they collected couldn't have been sent wirelessly. They actually flew it out basically on hard disk. Um, so to, to and then combined it all in in a central center and sunk, synced up the wave band, um, and produced. A beautiful image, which we get to enjoy, but I, I think there's a lot more exciting science being being used than just just the visuals here. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I, I think maybe even the image for for our for our our galaxies uh, black holes already um, there. I, I, I think or wasn't it? I think it is. But I'm not sure if all the science is done yet. Has it already been published? I might have missed this. Oh, oh maybe maybe no. I maybe I confused this. Anyway, um, what I find really interesting about this, like, why is there? You know, why do they take a galaxy that's a thousand times further away than our own black hole? Well, one of the reasons is that the black hole is also a thousand times bigger. So, actually, like it, it looks the same size, uh, this black hole and our black hole, just because that one is a thousand times further away and a thousand times heavier. 
Um, we got a question. Is the Big Bang responsible for creation of all kinds of energy in the universe? How did all this energy came to how did all this energy came to be in the first place? Okay, the first question I can answer. The second question is a really hard one. Um, so, kind of with the Big Bang, we usually mean kind of the the very beginning, where uh, where we can't really know like how the you know how the very beginning of the universe happened. We just have a quite a good idea of the first kind of fraction, like up to the the very very really small first fraction of a second. Um, we don't know, but then you know the next few nanoseconds, and and from there on, we are quite sure what happened. So basically, um, we think that there was some some field in the beginning. We call it the inflaton, which caused the effect that we call inflation. It's not really important for now. It's just that there was some some object in the beginning, some uh, some material, and this decayed into the particles that we know today. So our kind of standard model of particles, and. Um, First, there was like lots of particles from everything, and it was the universe was very hot. So basically, there was a lot of energy, and the universe started expanding. So, I mean, yeah, it's just, it's just hot because there's like just a lot of energy on a small space. But then the universe expands and it gets colder, as you could say, and kind of the energy goes down in general. And when it gets colder, and kind of particle like parts of particles combine into well whole particles. So, for example, in the beginning, you had lots of quarks running around. And then when it got cold enough, those quarks could kind of combine into, into protons and neutrons and other particles. And eventually when it gets colder and colder, those protons can combine with electrons to form hydrogen atoms, etc. So the universe gets kind of less hot and, and more, more normal. And um, for these kind of different kinds of energy, so yeah, there are various theories on how, how dark matter is created. So I mean, it could of course just be there from the beginning. Um, but usually what we call is, what we say is a um, so-called free freeze out. So basically what we mean is, what we think is that early in the universe, dark matter and matter could just effortlessly convert towards one e to each other. So that would be just be um, basically like convertible. But at some point, the universe got kind of into this cold state and kind of was expanding. And when it is expanding, particles get more and more diluted. So they collide much less often with each other. And only in these collisions can the conversion happen between dark energy and normal matter. Uh, sorry, dark matter and normal matter. So that's why we think at some point they just stopped being able to convert to each other, and then it was set in stone. Basically, the dark matter was there and couldn't change into anything else anymore. For the normal uh, matter, it's a bit more interesting because the, there were lots of kind of electrons and anti-electrons, so-called positrons, but eventually those collided and annihilated into energy. So out of the loads of electrons and slightly less anti-electrons that were there in the early universe, only a tiny fraction remained and everything else annihilated and produced the radiation, or most, well, a part of the radiation that we see today that's around the universe was kind of created from the electrons that annihilated. Not everything, like some of it was there before. Um, so yeah, there we have an, an, um, normal energy, um, matter, dark matter. For dark energy, I think yeah, well, it depends on what theory you think is dark energy. If it's just kind of a, what we say is a cosmological constant, it was probably there all the time from the beginning. Um, so there are various theories what it could be, and then it would get created in some way. And there are actually theories of kind of how dark energy could get created late in the universe. Like it wasn't there at the beginning, but got created at some point. So we are well, not sure at all. Um, but then at some point, well, there, there was dark energy and it also didn't inter interact with anything. So it was also just there, standing there at a constant density. And actually it was completely irrelevant for almost all of the history of the universe because everything else was dominating it. Like there was so much, <coughs> sorry, so much more matter than dark energy that you wouldn't even notice the dark energy. Just as everything diluted except dark energy because dark energy doesn't dilute. So after like all this expansion of the universe, <laughs> in the end, dark energy was kind of victorious because, well, it just didn't get diluted and, and it was left over in the end. Um, yeah, so basically that's explanation involves a lot of we actually have no idea. Um, we know pretty well what happened with those with those energies kind of over the time, but we don't know how they got created. Basically, that's that's yeah, it's kind of the sad truth. We we don't really know how how most things got created. We we know how say hydrogen and helium got created and all the elements. Actually, we know that. And we know how protons and neutrons got created. Um, but we just don't know where kind of the beginning came from. Um, yeah. 
Okay, um, let's also take one more question that we got from. Actually, yeah, there was one question, one question last last week that I prom uh, two weeks ago, and the last live stream that I promised I would ask this live stream. Um, it was um, what what jets are and or, or how would jets work? And do you think you can tell us a bit about that? You can also get your pretty picture oh, of one. So yeah, this is this is not this is not my area, but I, I have I have a vague idea. I think I got this asked this in, a, in an interview question or something. Oh. But, um, but yeah, so the so at the um, cause of all galaxies, um, or as far as we know, um, are supermassive black holes. So these are Mach black holes which have uh, of order 10, 100 billion suns in one point in space. Um, so it's not actual suns, right? It's just mass sorry, that is as massive as a sun. The, the, mass, the mass of 100, 100 million suns. Um, and these sitting in the centers of galaxies are often spinning very fast and they have matter which is falling all around them, falls into a disk, much similar to how you might think of, of, of the galaxy orbiting in a disk or the planets of the, the solar system are orbiting around the sun often in a disk. It's, as matter falls in, it often falls into a disk formation. But around a, around a black hole, this becomes very hot. It becomes ionized. You have lots of ions, so charged particles moving around this disk which are all interacting with one another as they gradually collapse into this black hole, which is also spinning incredibly quickly because of all the mass that's already fallen into it. Now, the tricky bit, when you actually get incredibly close to the surface of the black hole, so it's what we call the, the event horizon, the point of no return, beyond which nothing can escape the black hole. Very close to that surface um, is something called the, the ergo spin. Now, this is the bit which I don't understand very well, but space in that in that place gets dragged around with the spin of the black hole now if you're a particle falling into the black hole just before you reach the black hole surface you get spun up incredibly fast by this super spinning black hole now the the tricky bit is that you have other matter which is nearby which is also interacting with you and you might have a magnetic interaction with that matter as you get spun if the other particles get left behind your magnetic field, the, the, the line which connects the magnetism between you and the other particles, gets stretched out around the black hole and wrapped up really, really fast. This creates a really dense magnetic field around the black hole. So as more particles fall in, they get accelerated by this incredibly dense magnetic field and get accelerated perpendicular to the magnetic field. So that's either up or down, directly away from the black hole, polar to the, to the accretion disk. So you have this disk accreting in, and then at very much at the center, you get particles being accelerated very fast out vertically. Um, and those particles are what we see as, as the jet. As they get accelerated out, they then um, slow down by radiating away energy. And that's, that's the radiation we see as these jets from, from the black holes. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my understanding of how it works. It's, it's a, a mechanism which is in terms of exactly how it works and the mass behind it is, is slightly beyond me, but, um, but that's my understanding of how, how these particles actually get accelerated. So it's, it's hot ionized gas which is around a black hole, particles which are charged around the black hole as they fall in, get accelerated straight up into these very, very tightly collimated jets away from the, the black holes. And that's what we see, which creates some really nice, lovely pictures, including from, from M87. Again, that's another, this is one of the ones, cool things about M87, the, the pictures of M87's jets are really spectacular, if I've got the right one. Um, so yeah, that's that's a cool one to look at. That's a really cool um, image of a um, a classic black hole jet. Um, I, I will add that to the slides uh, for next for next time. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask you for for that picture. Um, yeah, sure. <laughs> but yeah, the, these these kind of black holes that accrete matter and you know produce jets are uh, really uh, like a phenomenon that's a lot like used a lot in in astronomy actually. Like basically, these objects are called quasars, uh, which stands for crazy star. Um, basically. They look like they're really small. I mean, they're black holes, so that's basically why they're really small and not like you know galaxies, which are kind of large. Um, so people thought actually, like you know, some time ago, they thought those were stars, but well, they weren't really stars, and they were far too bright to be a star actually. Um, actually, this this thing like this quasar can be brighter than you know a whole galaxy would usually shine. So that's like no way this could be a star. Um, and people noticed it's like looks kind of different. Like sometimes it looks like really bright and. Has like lots of gamma rays and like I'm not sure if it's gamma rays, um, but like a very different spectrum, like lots of high energy um, particles, probably X-ray um, particles. While from other directions, like sometimes it looks more like radio, 
And that actually was something really impressive people found out is that it's all the same thing, like it's all black holes that are kind of accreting matter. It's just what direction they're pointing at. Like when we look at it from the side, it looks more like you know a radio galaxy. And if we look right into the jet, it uh, looks like what we call a blazer. So that's a really high energy, really bright source in the sky. Um, and yeah, actually there's, there's kind of one that's uh, made famous, which is like also pointing towards Earth with, with its, its jet. Oh, of course, far away, so it's not dangerous. Um, but we actually think we have discovered a neutrino which came from, from that blazer uh, towards us. And um, with ice cube, it was a couple of, couple of years ago. So those are really, really exciting. Okay, um, very good, very good answer. Uh, that's that's a nice thing about you know having different people on this live stream. I can ask all the questions uh, <laughs> to new people when I don't get when we don't have an answer. And yeah, we got <laughs> we we have one more question from from Joe here on um, on on Slido, which is um, about special relativity. So we just talked a bit about this you know whole whole relativity thing. This is uh, slightly similar. It's um, if time slows down and accelerates, uh, stopping at the speed of light, uh, shouldn't time go infinitely fast as you are still? So that's a nice observation. Um, so it's, it's correct that when you, basically when you, as, as you go faster, the time of like, let's say you're in the spaceship and you know the spaceship is going with say half the speed of light, then time goes slower for you compared to someone who is, you know, say waiting on earth. When I would go in the spaceship for half a year or maybe two years, uh, would, would fly around with maybe, I don't know, half the speed of light or something, I would come back to Earth, um, I would be much younger than all my colleagues who were the same age before. And if you would go with almost the speed of light or as close as the speed of, like really, really close to the speed of light, time would be almost standing still. Like I would go in a spaceship, you know, go to, let's say 0.999 times the speed of light, uh, fly around Earth for, you know, a year or so, come back out for me, just one second or so would have passed, while for Earth, a whole year would have passed. Um, now, uh, the question is, what happens when you go slower? And actually, the the kind of prediction of special relativity or the, the kind of math uh, points comes out to uh, the speed of, of kind of time going for you is is a one plus kind of the speed factor. So when you have no speed at all, time just goes as normal speed, as like kind of one. And then uh, the kind of factor by which time is slowed down is well, for, for small, I think it's for small speeds, it's like one plus speed over speed of light, right? So when you go like, let's say, well, okay, the formula is a bit more complicated. Um, I think there might be a factor somewhere in there. Um, anyway, basically, when you go at zero speed, the, the kind of factor is one, so normal normal time, time speed. And when you go closer and closer to the speed of light, the factor goes larger and larger. So when you are standing still, the time just goes normally. There's no, there's no mysterious uh, things happening there. But it's a good, good question, good observation. This is the thing, right? It's not, it's not that you're not experiencing time going slower. As far as you're concerned, you're still experiencing time when you're whizzing around in that spaceship around the Earth. You're still experiencing time, go as far as you're concerned, going normally. But it's just relative to the people on Earth who's, from their perspective, your time is going incredibly slowly. They're going through days and, and you've gone through, through milliseconds of time. Um, so it's so as far as you're concerned, you're still having that that factor, which is always one, because you're not moving relative to yourself. You always expe experience time going at the same speed. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's it's also asked. that's also a really interesting thing. Like, right as you say in the spaceship example, when I walk on the spaceship and you don't accelerate, I don't even notice. Well, I mean, I feel kind of pressed in the seat when we accelerate, but I don't notice anything strange happening with time. I watch my watch. It just goes normally, you know? It's just when I get out and everyone else tells me you've been in there for a year, I'm like, what? No, it was like 10 seconds. Like that's, yeah. that's, I mean, what would happen if you had like such a futuristic, really, really fast spaceship? In practice, this effect is really, really small. Like you would need kind of atomic clocks to, to actually measure this. And I think they computed it for some cosmonaut who was in sp on the ISS for, you know, a year or so. It was like a tiny fraction of a second. And um, so it's not noticeable at all in real life. They have they have to compute it for all satellites. So this is this is one of the reasons why um, one of the applications is not. I mean, Einstein's theories of relativity are, are all very interesting scientifically, but they're also incredibly important for everyday life because we rely heavily on when we're traveling and when we're doing things around the Earth. We rely on GPS. So GPS, we have a signal which is bouncing up and down from satellites and working out the distance from us to that satellite. And in order to do that, the satellites have very precise clocks on them 
which measures the amount of time passing when light goes through various distances in between satellites. But in order for that to work, those satellites all need to be perfectly synced up in time. But any slight offset due to this relativistic shift of times, because they're not experiencing time the same way, will put them out of sync. So we have to correct for this special this this relativistic factor um, when 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 doing when syncing up clocks. So these these things are really important for everyday lives. So yeah, so on, on satellites on it, it is um, it is incredibly important to, to correct for this um, for these effects. Yeah, yeah. Um, we just got a question on Slido um, a few minutes ago. Um, is there a supermassive black hole near the Milky Way galaxy? Yeah, do you want? Is yeah, it, yeah, <laughs> there is well. But more, more precisely than near the Milky Way galaxy, there's, there's one in the center of the Milky Way galaxy. So so we, where we are, so we have um, the Milky Way, think about the Milky Way as, as a disk or a large plate. Um, in terms of this, where the stars are on this plate, uh, we're probably about, I don't know, two thirds the way out, maybe, maybe half to two thirds the way out relative to the center of the plate. That's where we sit in this galaxy. But right in the center of that plate is a supermassive black hole which is called Sagittarius A star. The reasons it's called that are for historical reasons it's to do with where it lies in the sky relative to Sagittarius constellations and so on. Um, but it's um, this is this is the supermassive black hole which is at the core of our galaxy. Um, and we know that fairly precisely and we know how massive it is because we've seen stars um, orbiting this black hole very close. We see the stars come in and get fast accelerated on their orbits so that they go really long banana orbits um, where they go out and then get come back in and very quickly whip around effectively the central black hole. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, the those stars have been are very much connected to the recent Nobel Prize Award. If I, I haven't got this wrong, I think the Nobel Prize Award was partially to do with the measurements of orbits of stars around the Milky Way central black hole. Um, so yeah, I, I double, I'll double check that. Don't be quoting on that. So I'll, 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 I'll double check that one for I confirm. But I, I'm pretty sure that was was the um, the the most recent uh, Nobel Prize in physics was awarded to um, two people who've been working on on black hole physics. I think they've, they've been working on different parts of this. Um, they got part part of the award each, but um, but certainly part of it was to, to do with uh, the orbits of, of stars around our central supermassive black hole. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's, 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 there is one there. And there are others nearby in the local group as well because we're not the only galaxy. There's other galaxies which are um, are nearby the Milky Way. Um, so you have uh, the Andromeda Galaxy, our closest neighbor, that will also have a central black hole. We were already talking about M87. That's also a nearby galaxy which will also have a central supermassive black hole. Um, as, as Stefan said earlier, that one's much more massive than ours. Um, and is incredibly bright relative to ours, um, but yeah, there, there there are there are nearby supermassive black holes, but they're all at the centres of the galaxies where where stars have collapsed in and formed around um, these black holes. They're sort of at the centres of where mass collapses in towards. Yeah, we just got a question on, on YouTube about um, the shape of of the universe. Um, so, what kind of what's up with the geometry and shape of the universe? It sounds like a question uh, for me this time. Um, so, the universe, yeah, there, there are kind of a few things you could, could consider. Um, and just to make sure, I don't think I have an echo. Okay. Um, I think you're right. Leslie, um, right, so the one thing is kind of how, like, what's kind of how, like, what's the, the size of the universe in like kind of three dimensions? Like, you look, okay, um, how far go, does the universe go on in that direction, that direction, like, you know, left, right, top, bottom, etc. Um, and basically, we don't know, I, we, we're not aware of any kind of limitation of the universe, like as far as we're concerned, it's probably infinitely large, or certainly larger than what we can observe. Um, there is what we call the observable universe, which is basically just a sphere around us, because that's just how far could light travel since the Big Bang until today, so we can see something. So we can't see anything that is further away than, let's say, 100 billion light years, because nothing could have, like, if there would be something there, I mean, there probably is something there, maybe in a nice galaxy, but the light from there takes so long to come to us, it's not arrived yet. So we will only see that in a few more billion years. Um, and then the other thing, like that's basically kind of universe, like kind of today, kind of in space. But then there's, there's this thing of space itself, and if, or like 
if it's curved and if, if so, how much and in what direction. So if you imagine kind of the universe being two dimensional, so just imagine like, you know, it's not 3D space, but two, D, two dimensional, then it would be kind of a large plane somewhere, right? Um, and the universe, like our universe would be this plane, but it could also be wrapped into a sphere. So that would mean if you are in the universe and would go into one direction for, you know, long enough, you would just come out at the other end and meet where you, st like arrive again where you started. I mean, we of course try to measure this and found out if it is curved is very, very flat, but actually there's some evidence that it might maybe be curved. It's currently a bit of discussion in, in physics uh, or in, in cosmology, astronomy. Um, and it's probably flat, like most observations parent towards being flat, but there's a bit of tension and we are not 100% not sure at the moment. Um, and actually the uh, third way would be it being kind of shaped um, like kind of like a saddle. So that's what we, we call this positive and negative curvature. So the positive one, well, the, the sphere one's quite easy to explain. It's basically just you kind of go around um, and it's kind of kind of like a loop. Um, and the other way, it's it is curved, but it is not closed. Like you, you can't go in one direction and come out at the other end. So basically, if you imagine, say, basically it's like a saddle saddle shape. So if you have like a two D sphere and then you bend it in one direction at the at, in the one di sorry. You bend it one way in the one direction and the other way in the other direction, you get like a saddle shape and that would be what we call, well, the other way, like a negative curvature. Um, and the way you could detect those curvatures is basically drawing triangles. So when you take a piece of paper, draw a triangle with, you know, all the angles, let's say you draw a, a tri triangle with, with three equal angles or like, six, um, what is it, 66 degrees or oh, my math skills in public. Well, idea, 60 degrees, of course. Um, and then you measure the side lengths of this triangle. And then you calculate, you know, if the, if the length, actually I'm not sure if, the, if that is the right triangle to draw. Anyway, there's a certain, like, you draw a, a, a triangle, let's say not a um, equilateral one, but you know, one with a right angle or something. And you, either you check if all the sides match what you predict, or you make the side lengths a certain length and measure the angles. And this, if the universe is flat, the sum of the angles will be exactly 180 degrees and you know all the numbers will match. But if the universe is curved, the, or what, which way was it? Um, the angles are I think too large. Like the sum of the angles will be larger than 180 or smaller in the other way around. Um, and you can't do this, you know, on a, well, you can do this on a piece of paper, but you would only notice if the universe would be like very, very um, curved. So, I mean, what you can do is, you know, put satellites in space and do the measurements between those but we still didn't find anything. So I think there's no, like that's a practical way of measuring curvature that would in theory work, like this kind of helps you imagine this. Um, but in practice, it's, we tried this and the universe is not nearly as curved. Like from cosmological observations, from observations of the kind of Big Bang and the cosmic micro effect ground, we know if the universe is curved, it's very, very slightly curved and, and there's no way it could affect us anytime soon in kind of daily life. Oh, and there we go. There is a wormhole question. Um, but I'm talking <laughs> about the curved universe. Um, so wormholes are kind of a, a hypothesis that like things that could theoretically exist. Um, we have no, we don't like, we have no kind of indication that they would exist. And um, so it's probably kind of unlikely. Um, so oh yeah, well, the first question, part of the question, why do wormholes exist? Like they are mathematically possible, but personally I wouldn't think they exist. And there's no hints or no evidence that they would exist. So uh, they might not, not exist at all. Um, what happens if something gets sucked in? So the theory behind the idea of wormholes is basically I explained how space is kind of, kind of can be curved. And what you could imagine, let's go back to our two-dimensional space and curve it into like a sheet that goes kind of around and above it, like, you know, comes close to another, other, another part of this, of this sheet. And then those two pieces of the sheet could be connected um, to like to each, each other by kind of well by by space, um, and that's what we would, would call a wormhole. And like in theory, you could have a connection, and you might be able not sure about that to travel through this connection to kind of go to a far away part of space without you know spending billions of years to go that way. Um, but yeah, the problems are a. Uh, we don't like they probably don't exist. It's just a kind of mathematical 
possibility that they could, in theory, exist. Um, B, getting through them is probably like quite hard. Like we don't know where well, we have no idea what they like how that would look like. I think you might be able to do some computations. It might be similar to black holes in terms of you know stresses on your spacecraft. So it's probably really hard to make a crash spacecraft that would go through one. Um, C, if there would be one and would be anywhere near us, I think we would have discovered it. So if there would be a wormhole, they would probably be quite far away, which would also be kind of um, meh, because everything that's more than a few light years away will take us years to get to. Um, but yeah, <laughs> it's a nice possibility. Like if there would be wormholes, I would be happy. It would be great. I think most theoretical physicists would be very happy to, you know, uh, get lots of new work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, we just got a few comments on Periscope. As as always, thanks for the correction at at X Abyss. Um, or the comments, I guess. Um, the que well, the the comment is is the ergosphere. So you're talking about the ergosphere when you're talking about jets. And said so there's the one part you don't understand. And we got the question, of course, is the ergosphere like a pseudo-stable torical volume that particles can orbit without being sucked in? Um, I have no idea. I, I'm afraid you've gone <laughs> way over my head here. Um, yeah, I, it, the way that it's explained that um, is, is plausible in terms of my understanding of, of what an ergosphere is. Um, but my, my understanding is limited to some um, terms which I know about <laughs> how it's going around and a vague understanding of, of how how space gets dragged around a black hole. But that's that's about as, as deep as I understand it, I'm afraid. Um, so yeah, I, I could I could probably research some more about this, but um, yeah, I'm afraid uh, you, 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 you've already gone beyond me with what you said there. You, you potentially told me things which I, I didn't know, so, so thank you. Um, <laughs> maybe maybe one, one simpler, a thing that you can, I mean, they, they exist, so you're talking about kind of particles, I mean, I guess you know, obviously you know this, but for everyone else, um, when you have a black hole, uh, we, of course, uh, you mentioned that when you're like at kind of two times the the um, the radius, oh, sorry, at a, at a certain radius, the so-called threshold radius, nothing can escape anymore, right? As soon as you're in there, you can't get out. Um, and if you're slightly above this, you pr probably also fall in, right? So. You can escape only when you're flying away from the black hole. So the question is, what is the kind of closest distance you could safely, you know, go around the black hole? And there's a point that's so-called photon sphere, or there are always other names, um, where a photon could, like a, a light particle, a photon, could go around the black hole and basically, for, for all of eternity, fly around in circles around the black hole. Um, so this kind of exists in theory. And practice, usually, as soon as it gets slightly away from this path, the photon flies away. So either it you know, goes out or falls slightly inwards and, and goes inside. Um, but there exists this kind of idea of you can orbit a black hole without being sucked in. And it gets much more complicated if a black hole is rotating, which I have no idea about. Like, I know black holes are not rotating, but when black holes start rotating, it's, it's not my, my regime anymore. So, yeah, ex expanding out on that again, it's there's also another thing called the, the last stable orbit, which is the last moment for any normal matter orbiting a, a black hole beyond which a circular orbit is not possible um and which point it would would collapse into the black hole again this is for this is for non-spinning black holes <laughs> i don't know how this changes it definitely changes when you have include spin um and from from my understanding of what uh the comment from x has said um the it creates other features which are um which are interesting in terms of how uh pseudo a pseudo stable area might form around a black hole but um yeah again as i say stretching well beyond my knowledge of of, of black hole mechanics <laughs> okay we got two more uh, questions on youtube and um, let maybe start with the second one because that's one that i don't know so let's see if you know um why does tidal heating occur oh oh that's a really nice okay if if i understand what what we mean by tidal heating right here so this is so my understanding with this would be if you have a solid object orbiting around a, um, a star, like for example, let's say a planet orbiting around uh, a star, mm -hmm. uh, the the planet gets effectively heated up by the the potential which they by by that orbit. Um, that that okay. So that's that's my understanding of what the question's referring to. Um, sorry if sorry if I've misinterpreted this. <laughs> But the um, so okay so yeah so if you've got if you've got a planet orbiting around a massive object like a star so for example the Earth orbiting around the sun as it goes round the 
the object orbiting is actually slightly elongated by the object is or the, the, the gravitational pull it's in. So that, that stretches it out because anything which is close to the star or for the Earth close to the sun it is pulled towards the sun. Anything on the other side of the Earth is pulled towards the sun slightly less strongly because it's a little bit further away. And the further you are from the object, the weaker its gravitational pull. So as a result, stuff close to the star gets pulled a bit more and stuff the outside star doesn't get pulled quite as much. So the objects get stretched out a bit. So in practical terms, uh, the North Pole, in, like during summer, the North Pole would be kind of uh, be pulled towards the sun stronger than the South Pole, and therefore the Earth would be kind of slight, slightly elongated. Yes, yeah. So for, I mean, in, summer, for, for, in summer for, for us in the UK, or in anyone in the Northern Hemisphere, yeah. Um, the, oh, the North. summer, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I don't, I don't know, if, I don't know who's, who's, who might be joining. Who knows, maybe we've got, maybe we've got crowds from the Southern Hemisphere. I don't know, I don't want to... <laughs> <Yep. laughs> no, um, sorry to anyone in, in Australia or South America. Or, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. But, but yeah, okay, so anyway, so that, that, that happens. And as the um, Earth sees the orbit, um, the where the, the star is changes because the Earth's moving around that. And so a slightly different part gets pulled out. So now we're going maybe into spring. And so we're getting pulled more from the equators than from the poles. And then you go to the next season where it gets pulled in the opposite direction. And as a result, you're getting this, this stretching and contorting of the, of the planet. And that stretching and contorting can generate heat. Um, now the extreme where this can happen is you get another property called, called tidal locking. So this is something which is important if you if you ever wondered why we never see the dark side of the moon. Um, for uh, if anyone's unsure, the the dark side of the moon is slightly a misnomer. The dark side of the moon is not always dark. It's just that we can never see the dark side of the moon. It might be facing the sun and we're seeing only one side of it. Um, but the point is we can never see the side which faces the sun. So that's why we call it the dark side. And the reason why the moon does that is because it's tidally locked. So the extreme is that when when this distortion, um, when you move slightly further around in your orbit, the distortion also means that that part which is being pulled towards the Earth in the moon case is is pulled around a bit. You're, you're, you're dragging it back towards you. You're preventing it from spinning away. So as it goes round, it gets slightly, every time it orbits the Earth, it gets slightly pulled into an alignment such that it spins and always has that faint same side pulled towards the Earth. Um, and so that's how the moon became tidally locked to the Earth, such that we only ever see one side of it. Um, so yeah, I hope I hope that was the question <laughs> you were asking. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if that is exactly what tidal heating means, but that's what I I, I would have guessed it it, it meant. Yeah. <laughs> it's not, I, I it's think not so. Yeah. Back, so um, I think that also yeah. happens on some moons in like in I think Jupiter or Saturn or something. Uh, I, th I think that's a reason why they are like. For where they get their energy from, or is it different? Yeah, yeah, no, very, very much could be. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, so like, I'm not sure which is it. Is it Io, which is the closest one? I oh, yeah. You, to, <laughs> I'm sure we, we, we'll, we'll get a correction in the chat soon. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, um, but one of them gets gets superheated, I think, because of similar processes. But it, it is because it's extremely close to to Jupiter itself. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, I think so. Okay. Um, <laughs> now we've now we got, got a, a also very interesting question. How is entropy related with time? Uh, which is a very good question. OK, so for, for the un uninitiated, let me quickly explain. Oh, there we go, the oceans of Europa. Um, so entropy. Entropy is kind of a quantity physicists use to describe how, let's say, ordered or unordered something is. And that's not something that only happens you know, in rooms of students. It also happens in nature that stuff in general, doesn't get more ordered by itself. So when you have, you know, say an ice crystal, um, actually, this is okay. Let's let's go with something easier. Um, when you have, you know, a gas, like let's say you have a gas, you have hot gas here and cold gas here, and you let them mix. Like when you, you know, let them interact with each other, they will mix around. Or let's say you have hydrogen here and helium there, here, and you let them mix, they will mix, but they will never spontaneously kind of go separate themselves again. And um, that's something that's kind of very fundamental um, and happens basically everywhere in the universe. Like when you want to produce order or some ordered things, you have to spend energy. Uh, humans are very ordered, like kind of in terms of, you know, we have a head, we have arms, we have, they're not like a mass of gas. And that's basically because 
we are spending energy to kind of preserve the structure, like our bodies are using energy. And um, same happens, of course, with plants and other life. Um, and so in general, in like when you look at the kind of large closed system, there's a law of thermodynamics, which applies in certain cases that energy always stays the same or increases, so things get less ordered. And you could use, like this is one of the few things in physics you can use, I mean, there are various other things that are with some caveats, um, but that you can use to tell which direction time is flowing. So let's say I show you a movie of, I don't know, a pendulum. You had no idea if it was playing backwards or forwards. If I show you a movie of the solar system, you would have no idea if it's you know, going backwards or forwards if you don't know if our planets are rotating counterclockwise or clockwise. And this is true for most things in physics. Like when I show you like a reaction of, let's say, an annihilation of electrons into, into nothing, into photons, it could also be a pair production. So two, like photons producing an electro electrons and positrons. So many processes in physics are kind of symmetric with respect to, I just let you know the recording run backwards. Um, but this entropy process is something you can always tell. But you see, you know, entropy is increasing in one direction. You know, okay, that's the direction time is running into. Um, and that's kind of a very useful and a relation which has some kind of philosophical applications. And it's in, with, with a few caveats, it's like applicable maybe to the universe as, as a whole. And which, which kind of basically leads you to the idea of um, the universe eventually, after a really, really long time, will just be kind of a mass of uniform, warm-ish gas because it won't, like, the entropy has to decrease, so it has to get less and less ordered. So at some point you have to have less and less, you know, objects like stars and planets. Um, but don't worry, I'm, I'm talking about end of the universe again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it will be a long time before that happens. But yeah, basically that's, that's the whole deal with entropy. I think there are a few, like, theoretical physics ideas that do this even in a more fundamental sense. Um, but I'm not, not that sure about this. So yeah, that's the basic, basic idea between entropy and time. And yeah, we are also already at 7 p.m. Uh, UK time. Uh, so one hour, whatever time your time zone after we started. And so thank you all for joining. Um, thank you, Andy, for answering all the questions. Um, it was um, also yeah great for, for all the people answering, uh, asking questions and partially answering questions. Uh, thanks again for the confirmations from the Periscope chat at XMS. Um, yeah, and thank you for um, for checking me on the, the Nobel Prize. I'm glad I, I got that right, so thank you very much. <laughs> um, we'll see you again, uh, hopefully, in two weeks. So we'll be live streaming again in two weeks, same place, same time. If you want more astronomy content on this channel, there are lots of things going on. So just check out the channel page. There will be live streams and, and other events. And otherwise, um, thanks again. I'm looking forward uh, to seeing you again in two weeks.